Today, I'm going to build my favorite of all of the Corsairs. This is the Clayman Corsair, based on Okinawa in 1945. And if you don't know why this Corsair is special, well, it really has to do with the pilot. You see, Clingman, who was a Marine, executed the perfect high-altitude interception of a Japanese Dyna over at Okinawa. But then his guns froze. So he chopped that Dyna to bits with his propeller. I like that sort of moxie. In this part one, I'm going to show you some easy techniques to improve the venerable Tamiya kit. I'll be installing a Quinta cockpit, wiring the engine, fixing an annoying seam, adding some machine gun barrels, improving the landing gear, and scratch building armored glass. The Tamiya 48 scale Corsair has been in production for over 25 years, and why not? For an early variant, in this scale there is still nothing out there that can touch this kit. I've built at least eight of them, and I want to make one thing clear. This 1990s era kit is a good one. I recommend it. Now remember that I said that. Because the Tamiya Corsair isn't perfect. Far from it. It has a few annoying problems, and in this video, I'm going to show you some ways to fix those issues and improve your build of this kit. So how about we start with the cockpit? Actually, this is one of the strong points of the kit, and Tamiya did a great job engineering it. Out of the box, it more than looks the part. So if you go that way, just follow the instructions and painting guide, and you'll be happy. I want it to be slightly happier, so I went with a 3D cockpit that I had in the stash. And when it comes to gussing up a cockpit, these sets are incredibly easy to install. Why? Well, because unlike a lot of resin, they actually fit. And now we're lucky to have several companies producing these products. All you need to do is shave off the detail, paint the parts, spread on some crystal clear, and uh, let it get tacky. Then get the paper backing off the parts and slip them on. It really is that easy. Contrast that with hours and hours of hacking out resin bits, getting them to fit, painting them. Well, this is an absolute dream for those of you who want to actually finish models. I decided to get a little fancy with the Ultracast seat. I first painted it in aluminum lacquer paint, and this was followed by a coat of chipping fluid. After my base color dried, I got some really nice big paint chips off the seat using a short bristle brush and some water. And once I was happy with those, those results, I installed the 3D seat belts. Man, I just, I just love these things. And here it is, that wonderful Tamiya Magic. The cockpit unit fits together like a watch and is ready to install in the fuselage. But before we get there, let's, uh, let's improve the kit engine. This time I'm going to go a bit old school and using some very cheap materials, I'll improve the look of the engine. As you can see, the pushrod detail is decent, but there aren't any ignition wires. So I'm going to use lead wire to make those. Starting with the needle, I poke divots where I want to drill the holes. Using the engine as a guide, I poke two holes in front, in front of each cylinder, and then between those I poke two more for the rear bank, rear bank of cylinders. Now, why lead line? Well, it's easy to work with, and it can be glued using super glue, and it stays glued. It also takes paint well, but most importantly, it's malleable, and I can make it look like hoses or wiring or whatever I need it to look like. In the past, I've used copper, I've used uh, brass, I've used photo etch, and I've used plastic to replicate ignition wires, and none of those, for, at least for me, work as well as lead line. Downsides? Well, it is lead. Lead is poison, so don't eat it or lick it. And make sure to wash your hands after handling it. Actually, that's solid advice for pretty much every scale model supply out there. This is probably the best time or best point in time to paint the tubes in front of the cylinders. These are almost always universally a gloss black color. And on the Tamiya kit, they're molded on, but if you paint them carefully, um, they pop out as if they were separate parts. Once those tubes are dry, you just pop on the ignition ring. And 
yeah, it looks pretty bad right now because those ignition lines are way, way too long. But the fun is about to begin. And there really is no magic to it. As you work your way around the engine, one of the wires goes in the hole in front of each cylinder and the other curls around the back of the same cylinder. So let's just take a quick look at the real thing. Each ignition cable has some slack, but not a whole lot of it. I don't bother measuring. I just snip a little bit off the end of the line and I try to fit it. And if it doesn't look right, I just snip off some more. Uh, it's lead line, it's easy to cut. And after a few cylinders, you know, I have a pretty good idea of how much line to use for each one. Uh, the next step is up to you because it is tedious. Uh, I use very thin strips of Tamiya tape to make the brackets for each pair of ignition wires. Again, no magic here. It's just patience and fiddly work. And to finish up the engine, I paint the ignition lines a khaki color, and then I follow that painting with, uh, or by painting the clamps an aluminum color. Moving on to the wings, we can make a fairly simple improvement. The outer wings uh, contain holes for six machine guns, which is correct. Uh, those wings will definitely need holes. But what's missing are the actual six guns, or at least the barrels for them. I made mine using needles and some evergreen I-beam strips. Um, I got the, the needles from, or the needle tips from eBay years ago. They're not sharp, uh, they're incredibly cheap. It's, you get hundreds of them in your order. The only downside is that removing the plastic is a bit of a pain, it's a bit messy. And as you'll soon see, cutting the tubes down to size is also a bit tricky. The idea here is to elevate the tube so they are centered in the holes and not otherwise resting on the openings. So I, I slid the I-beam to the right location, tested it several times, and then I glued the contraption in the wing. Now, once this glue is, once this is all glued in, there's a, a little amount of wiggle room to make e a slight adjustment so that the guns are in the center. Um, and if you wiggle it too far, no worries, it just, if it snaps off, you can just refix it in place with some uh, some tape and, and some more glue. The, the design of this kit is such that no matter how hard I try to minimize this particular gap during construction, I can never eliminate it. Um, this is where the center section of the wing attaches to the bottom of the fuselage and it always leaves this chasm of a seam. Uh, don't bother with filler on this. Guaranteed, you will never lick it. Um, it will reappear and you'll even flatten out the sides as you're sanding it. Go ahead, ask me how I know. No, the best way to eliminate this is to shove some thin strip styrene in the gap and then smooth things over. Once the strip is dry, I shave it down with a scalpel and I finish things off with various grades of sanding stick. I work slowly and, I, and carefully because there's a little bit of detail around here and I want to preserve it. If I'm careful and I, let, I, I could be left with a smooth round surface and no unwanted visitors uh, for some months in the future. Now the real Corsair had an armored windscreen atop the instrument panel and attached to it was the reflective glass that was used by the pilot to aim the guns. The kit part is not even close. It's a, a blocky thing and it fits into a massive hole left at the top of the cowl. Later on in this, uh, in this video, I'm going to scratch build a new armored glass piece, but first I'm going to fill these holes and make a smooth rounded surface. And I'm following the same steps as, as before with, uh, with the gaps on the side. So I shove some styrene in, I cut it down, and I smooth it out. Then I paint the, uh, the surface with NATO black. Turning now to the landing gear, there are a few simple, cheap, and fast ways to improve the stock model. The tail wheel is mostly hidden inside the fuselage, but part of it will be part of it will be visible. The real thing is a myriad of holes and springs, and I don't bother doing the guts. I just fix the visible bits, um, starting with the main, uh, I guess, brace for the unit. I drill out three holes, each one being slightly bigger than the last. I'm being careful with the initial separation here because I want to have space for the holes to get larger and larger as I drill down the line. 
Um, this kit part also features a solid plastic triangle that is just begging for an easy upgrade. Um, that's no problem. It is easily snipped off and replaced with some brass wire bent to look like a tie down. And if you're careful with removing that plastic triangle, you can even preserve the bolts that hold the tie down in place. Turning to the main gear, which are actually really nicely detailed from the box, there are two simple additions that can really punch them up. The first is to make some thin springs using some recycled headphone wire. I got out a toothpick to make the initial loop and I just kept twisting until I had a nice tight pattern. My advice is to do these all the same way. So pick 40 or 50 revolutions and that way they'll all look uniform. Next up are the brake lines. You can make these in a variety of ways, but again, I'm going back to my lead line because it stays exactly where I put it and it can be maneuvered into nice flowing bends. I started by drilling out the hub and then drilling out um, the, the rear door, the, sorry, the gear door bracket. Now on a real Corsair, this bracket isn't solid like on the model, but I want a nice reliable surface to put my gear door on and besides, once this part is installed, you'll never actually know it's a solid part. So I cheat a little and I drill a hole through the unrealistic bit and then I thread the lead line through it. Once you have the brake line in place and secure it with super glue, just place a couple of thin straps of Tamiya tape as brackets. Seal these with a touch of super glue as well. The last step here is to place the tiny springs on either side of the gear structure another small touch of super glue and they are secure enough to snip off at the top there you have it very easy and very simple improvements to these parts let's move out to the wing tips now on the real thing these are clear corners over a small colored light bulb on either side of the wing or other side of on both sides of the wings on the kit part these are just scribed in gray plastic and i think tamiya expects you to paint them Again, this is a fairly easy fix. The first step is to secure some robust, clear sprue. You don't need much, but it does have to be wide enough to, to match the end of the wingtip. Then cut out the kit lens and sand it as true as you can. Then taking a small drill bit, drill in a light bulb into the clear sprue. Now this is a balancing act, so don't worry if you don't get it right the first time. You can always try another one. You want to go about uh, about an eighth of an inch or a few millimeters at most. Enough for the bulbs to get in there, but not long enough because you'll sand through when you're shaping the, uh, the piece. Once you're happy with the depth of the bulb, fill that hole with red paint on one side and green paint for the other. And when that paint dries, um, paint the edges in a chrome color. And then super glue that piece right into the corner cut into the wingtip. Now it's gut check time, and I'm only kidding a little. Now take your time here, check your work, and use finer and finer files and sanding sticks as you shape the clear part. I keep my finger under the implements and protect the wing surfaces so that I don't accidentally scratch them. And when I get to the point that the clear bit is sanded down to the right size, I take out the mighty seven part polisher. This high-tech miracle modeling tool is, can, can be found at Walmart or Amazon or pretty much any dollar store for just a few bucks. Um, work through the ever finer grits and by the end you'll have a nice realistic part with a smooth, clear, polished, dare I say, sexy, smooth finish at the end of your wingtip. All right, last bit uh, is to improve the armored glass. This is what a Corsair armor glass part is supposed to look like. Um, a, tri a triangular piece installed in front of the instrument panel. Attached to the armor glass is that reflective plate that I mentioned before. The kit piece, very rudimentary. So it's easy to fix this. I use my circle cutter to determine the diameter of the fuselage at the cowl. This was done by trial and error using, using a piece of paper. I, actually, I used a few of them. When I got close, I locked in the cutter and I cut out a circle of some thin plastic from a bubble pack. I then measured out the approximate lengths of the part, made the cuts, 
mask the interior of the piece to make it look like a black frame on the outside. Once that was dried, I drilled, I, sorry, I cut out some small bits of strip styrene and a small bit of reflector glass out of the same bubble pack. Um, and I used craft glue to assemble this whole thing because I didn't want any crazing or fogging of the clear bits. And uh, after that, I installed it on the cowl and I used the windscreen to hold the part at the correct angle. So here we are with the assembly completed and the model ready for paint. I've been building Tamiya Corsairs since about 2007, and I've, and I've always put off building this particular one. And mainly because the checkerboard decals would have been a bit of, of a concern, but it was also one of those models where I wanted to do it right. So now I'm going to do it right. Part two of the build will focus on painting and finishing this Klingman Corsair. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask them in the comments.